Good morning, Destiny Church. Good morning, those here in person and those joining us online. Can we clap our hands and welcome our online community today? For those that don't know, my name is Daniel. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. Our lead pastors are out of town, almost out of country, celebrating their 25th anniversary as a family. And so, yeah, I'm sure if they're probably not watching right now, it's like 4 a.m., where they are, but I'm sure they'll see that later and appreciate it. They've asked me to share the word today, so I'm excited about that. I'm honored to be able to do that. But I wanted to start just here on this Memorial Day weekend and just say thank you to those that are either active duty or those that have served in any one of our armed forces. We honor you. We're so grateful to those that have lost a family member, a loved one, a friend, a co-soldier um, by, by the ultimate sacrifice that anyone could give and for this country and for our freedom. We honor you. We're so grateful for the sacrifice that they made and that you make as a military family. And so God bless you today. God keep you today. Um, you know, a lot of us will enjoy some kind of break tomorrow, but let us all be mindful of of what it's all about. Let us all take a moment tomorrow and thank the Lord for the sacrifice that so many have made. Amen? Amen. All right. I had a really, really hard time coming up with the word to share this morning. I had a lot of different ideas, like probably at least six, and I started typing out some different ideas for different messages, and I'm sure that any of them would have been fine, and I say that because anytime we make time to get into the word, we're going to grow, right? We're going to receive from it, right? But none of these ideas were really exciting me. They weren't making my baby jump, so to speak. And so I was really wanting to know what is the word that God has for Destiny Church today? So I prayed and I asked the Holy Spirit to reveal that to me. And on Monday, and if you know me, I'm a planner. I usually know what I'm going to talk about well before that. But it was Monday that God just made so vivid Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. They're my favorite verses. And I shared them with Lurie who so thoughtfully, prayerfully, and intentionally puts our set list together so that they complement the word that God has for the day. And so when I shared that scripture with her, she said that that very scripture had been on her heart and mind burning for the last three days. And so I took that as confirmation on Monday and then started digging in to, uh, to share with you. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 in the NIV says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Hmm. As Pastor Jacob just said, we're going to read the Bible today, and then we're going to go do what it says, amen? So often, we just do that first part. We read the Bible. We check it off the to-do list. We've got to do what it says, church. Would you pray with me? Good morning, Lord. We thank you for the gift of your word, this precious love letter that guides us in every way that we need guidance. I ask that you would speak to us today. Speak clearly. Help us to hear you clearly. Help us to receive every bit of truth that you have for us. And help us be quick to understand and apply your truth to our lives. In Jesus' name, the strong son of God. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Do you trust me? I want you to imagine God asking you that question this morning. Do you trust me? Perhaps you've asked someone that before. Do you trust me? Maybe you've been asked that by someone else before. Do you trust me? Aladdin extends his hand to Jasmine, inviting her on a magic carpet ride. He asks, do you trust me? She says, what? He repeats, do you trust me? She hesitates for a moment and says, yes. And then he whisks her off. Off they go. I can show you the world, shining, shimmering, splendid. Or we find ourselves aboard the Titanic. Jack asks Rose, do you trust me? 
He says, step up on the rail. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes closed. Do you trust me? And Rose replies, I trust you. And with her eyes closed, she stretches out her arms. And when she opens them again, she exclaims, I'm flying. Do you trust me? The dictionary defines trust as firm reliance or dependence upon the wholeness and ability of a person or thing. One in which confidence is placed, assumption and hope committed into the care of another. John Maxwell, author, speaker, and leadership guru, came up with an acrostic for trust. It's this, take an inventory. Now, in a quick time out, all of these notes are in the app that a lot of work goes into every single week. So if you've not downloaded that yet, you can even right now, and you can catch up and fill in some blanks later. Take an inventory. Recognize God as your source. Understand God's principles. Surrender everything to God. Test God's promises. Trust. Trust is a funny thing. Trust is a fragile thing, isn't it? Trust can be gained. Trust can be shaken. Trust can even be lost. It's often very difficult for us to trust, depending on on what it is or who it is in question that we're trusting. Trust requires faith. You just can't separate the two of those. So our main text again in the NIV, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. These same verses in the New Living Translation, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Again, in the message paraphrase this time, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. And finally, in the Amplified, trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your paths straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. Why do we take the time to go through four different translations of the Bible? Listen, if you are in the habit of only reading one translation of the Bible, I want to encourage you to start adding some more to the menu, okay? As we can see pretty clearly, each has this different perspective. Uh, Each one of these highlights like one of the original Hebrew words in this scripture, and we're going to look at those in just a moment. But if I could add anything to what Pastor Jacob said, it's read your Bible, read a bunch of different translations of it, and then do what they say, all right? Now, some context for our verses this morning. This is part of the portion of the book of Proverbs that's called the lectures of a father to a son. Notice in chapter 3, verse 1, make note of that, it begins with my son, or some versions say my child. Now, there's been some debate whether or not this was a biological father and son relationship, or if it was more of an apprentice-type relationship, like Paul and Timothy had. But in chapter 1, verse 8 of Proverbs, we see the word mother mentioned, and this suggests that it is, in fact, a biological father and son here in this passage. So I want us to keep that in mind. I think it'd be really cool if we even put ourselves in the shoes of the child, put ourselves in the shoes of the son being spoken to here as we think about our heavenly father talking to us, instructing us to trust in him, asking us today if we do trust him, all right? So we've defined trust from the dictionary. We've looked at how John Maxwell defines it, but I also want to take a moment and I want to highlight some of the original Hebrew words from these two verses. I think this is going to really, really help this text come to life. We start with the word trust from the Hebrew word bata, meaning rely on, put confidence in, to be confident, to lead to believe, make trust, trust. In whom? In the Lord. 
Lord from the root word kyrios, meaning master, owner, sir, of God. Capital Lord, capital master. This is who we are to place our trust in. Not in ourselves, not in someone else that has let us down before, but in our capital Lord, in our capital master, the very giver and owner of our plans. We're to trust him with all of our heart. Heart from the Hebrew word lev, meaning mind, conscience, middle. See, the heart was not just a body part to the Israelites. They certainly understood that the heart gave physical life, but there was much more, more to it than that. The heart is the place where you think and make sense of things. It's where you feel emotions and make choices. The heart is where hopes and desires are birthed. The heart is where we believe, and then that belief determines our behavior. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The heart is where we truly worship from. We're to trust the Lord with all of our heart and in all of our ways. That means we've got to commit our ways to him. We find the word lean in some versions from the Hebrew word san, meaning to lean oneself upon, to rely on. How many know the Lord is a firm and sturdy foundation to lean upon? Amen. He cannot be moved except by his compassion for us. He is solid. He is stable. He's able to withstand the weight of your dependence and he invites it. We find the word understanding from the Hebrew word bina, meaning insight, discernment, good sense, wisdom. Part of trusting in God is not trying to figure out everything on our own. There are going to be things in your life, maybe lots of things, certainly more things than you would like that you do not understand. Raise your hand if you've run into anything recently that you did not understand. All right. You've got to be okay with that. You don't have to like it. I don't like it. But you've got to be okay knowing that God understands. Because sometimes we miss it, don't we? Well, I won't speak for you. Sometimes I miss it. Sometimes my emotions and my past experiences can cloud my judgment and my discernment and my understanding. So I can't trust in what I understand or don't understand. I can't rely on my understanding and neither can you, church. And we can't wait for God's explanation either. I've waited a long time for God to explain himself to me. How many know I'm still waiting, right? God doesn't owe me an explanation. He's God. God does not owe you an explanation, but you owe him your trust. In verse six, we find the word ways from the Hebrew word derek, maybe derek, meaning path, route, road, journey, conduct, way of life. Now, all of our ways include, but are not limited to, our thoughts, our words, our decisions, our actions, our reactions. These are the ways we are to acknowledge. From the Hebrew word yada, meaning to know intimately, to recognize, understand, to be respected, to be known, to make oneself known. I like that. To show, teach, and to be made aware. When we acknowledge the Lord, it's like we're taking down our wall. It's like we're dropping our mask and we're giving him a personal invitation to come even closer. Imagine giving him a full access backstage pass. I know we got some concert goers in the house, right? Imagine giving you that full access backstage pass. Imagine giving that to Jesus. That's what we do when we acknowledge him. We make ourselves known to him to get closer. We find the word submit from the root word hupotasso, meaning to apply, serve, present, bring near, surrender, succumb, give in, 
give way, follow, yield, obey. We find two words from the same Hebrew word, make and straight, from the Hebrew word yasar, meaning to do good, do right, be straight, make straight, make smooth, to be evenly hammered, to gaze straight. Now, the same Hebrew word is used for these, and in the original Hebrew, it connects them as one thought, make straight, make straight, one statement. Make straight what? Make straight paths from the Hebrew word orah, meaning road, way, manner, conduct. This is so significant to me. It shows us that the path that the Lord wants to provide for us is a smooth one. It's an easier one than we often find ourselves on. It's easier and smoother than what we decide to go on ourselves. It's a smooth path, a firm path and even path, a path that we can literally see what is ahead. There are less surprises when we follow the path that God has laid out for us to take. We can literally gaze ahead and see what's to come. If, man, that's a big if, we will wholeheartedly trust in him. The problem is clear. We don't always trust in him, and that's why we find ourselves on unclear and bumpy paths. Now, if we put all of that together, I've come up with an original Hebrew amplified version. All right? Is this helping anybody? Good. Thank you for saying so, even if not. The original Hebrew amplified version, the O-H-A-V. I don't know if that's really a thing. Put your confidence in and fully rely upon the Lord, your master, from the seat of your emotions, the very middle of who you are. Do not rely or depend upon your insight, discernment, or good common sense. As you conduct yourself and live your life, look for God and remain open and aware of him, surrendering to his will. When you do this, God will make your next steps, the one you need to see and the ones you need to physically take, be clear and smooth. Amen? Amen. These two verses are what we know as a conditional promise. This is a promise from our Father to us as children. If we will do our part, then he will do his part every single time. So ask yourself this morning, do I trust the Lord with all my heart? Yeah, I want to to do that. Am I doing that? Do I acknowledge and submit to the Lord in all of my ways? Some of those ways we mentioned, right? Those are our thoughts and our words and our, our decisions, actions, and reactions. Am I submitting to the Lord in all of those areas of my life? Church, this has to be the goal that we're striving for. Because if we live in a way that shows we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and with our, and are acknowledging him, acknowledging him in all of our ways, not only will he direct our paths, that's a pretty good deal. That's good enough. But Isaiah 26, chapter 3 shows us something else. It says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed in you. Raise your hand if you could use some perfect peace. Those that trust in God are kept in perfect peace. That does not mean everything will be wonderful all the time, but you will be kept in perfect peace. It won't be something that you just experience from time to time. It won't come and go depending on the circumstance you find yourself in. God will keep you, plant you, make you remain and live in his perfect peace when You trust in him and fix your thoughts on him. Man, help us, Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I've often learned from the life and experiences of others. I've also learned from my failures because some people got to learn the hard way. Right, but there's much to learn from someone who has been there and done that. Amen? 
So that said, I want to look at some of the people in the Bible that demonstrated a life of great trust, especially in difficult times. And as we look at these different people, we'll find several different situations that they walked through. The Bible shows us how to trust God through the overwhelming demands of life. The Bible shows us how to trust God through bad news. The Bible shows us how to trust God when there seems to be no way out. How to trust God when a desire is left unfulfilled. How to trust God when things aren't how you pictured they would be. How to trust God in the middle of pain. How to trust God when you're taking a risk. How to trust God when you feel alone. How to trust God through fear and uncertainty. Let's look at some people in the Bible that walked through these very things and let's take note of the trust that they held on to. In Exodus 14, we find Moses trusting God when there is no way out. We know the story, right? God hardened the heart of Pharaoh and the Egyptians chased after the Israelites who were now stuck between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army bearing down upon them. And Moses tells the people, do not be afraid. All the while, he's still crying out to God. Raise your hand if you've ever tried to calm somebody else down, but you are about to lose the victory yourself. All right? That's what Moses is walking through right here. The Lord instructs Moses to lift up his staff, to stretch out his arms, and God divides the Red Sea, leading only the Israelites through to safety. Difficult times can lead us to a point where we feel like our backs are up against a wall and there are very few options before us to find a way out or a solution to overcome. We're left wondering to ourselves, how did I get here? I think that might have crossed the mind of the Israelites leaving Egypt. How did I get here? Raise your hand if you've felt that or if you've said that even recently. How did I get here? Look at what's going on around me. Yeah, I've felt that way before. I imagine our pastors had that thought a time or two with what they just recently walked through. How did I get here? I've discovered that when I feel that way, when I ask myself that question, how did I get here? I need to shift my thinking. I need to shift my perspective. I need to try and see this thing through the lens of the Holy Spirit and try to approach it with the eyes of Jesus. I've learned that a lot of things that I saw as a setback was actually setting up a move of God in my life. Let that encourage you this morning. Sometimes what we see as a setback is actually setting up something that God wants to do. God guided the Israelites to the exact place he wanted them to be. They didn't arrive at the Red Sea by themselves, pinned between it and the Egyptian army. God led them to that exact place of tension, right on the edge of the Red Sea. Water in front of them, Pharaoh bearing down on them. Why would he do that? They were in a position, they were in a place where only God could provide the way out. Fortunately, our God is an outside-the-box thinker. Everyone felt backed up against a wall, no way out. But that's because no one would have predicted that he would part the Red Sea and that they could walk through it, looking at water and, and turtles and fishies on either side of them. That did not cross anyone's mind. Why would it? It's ridiculous. It's miraculous. Only God. And this kind of experience occurs in our lives from time to time. Difficult times will happen to us all. Pastor Chris has said a number of times, everyone in here is either in the middle of something, has just walked out of something, or is going to walk into something probably sooner than later. We have, always, we have all felt as if we were in an impossible situation. But perhaps God could be preparing to show you just how powerful he is. It's easy to, to feel afraid of having nowhere to turn. These are the moments that we can see God at his best. God show his mighty hand the strongest. Your difficult situation 
is an opportunity for God to move. Picture yourself walking through the Red Sea and let it change your perspective about having a way out. And like Moses, keep trusting God when it seems like there is no way out. Because church, there is a way out, God's way, and he's gonna show it. In Judges chapter four and five, we see Deborah, and she trusts God as she goes through the various demands of life. See, difficulty, seasons where it's difficult to trust, they come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? Sometimes it isn't a drastic tragedy, but the busy chaos of managing life. Life is hard. It can be hard to trust God on any given regular day. That's not just me, right? Okay, good. With all that we want to accomplish on a weekly basis, with the never-ending to-do list, man, it can be so easy to get worn out and disappointed and feel like you haven't accomplished anything. You ever felt that way? Parents, moms, dads, humans? (laughs) Deborah was one of those amazingly talented people who seemed to be able to do it all. Go read her story. She was a leader. She was a judge. She was a prophetess. She was a wife. She was a mother. And along with that, she courageously led her people, the Israelite people, into battle. And I thought I was busy. And she's incredibly inspirational, but I can, I can feel sometimes like I can't relate to that. Right, like how did she do it all? Every day we work demanding jobs and and do what we can to help care for our families. We might not have the title that Deborah did, but life demands a lot from us each and every day. Putting out fires, settling disputes, helping people, finances, kids, spouses, health, career, groceries, laundry, et cetera, et cetera. Deborah's family, the people of Israel, had its dysfunctions and challenges just like many of ours do. Her family was just a whole lot bigger. But we can look to her as an example of how to handle the chaos in our daily lives and keep trusting. In Judges chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, I can't remember if I provided this text or not. But Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. What faith? Deborah believed and trusted God in a way that can be hard for us to do. God was real and present in her life, and she believed that the victory was already hers through God. Before a sword was lifted, she believed that the victory was hers. You have to see the victory before you see the victory. And because she knew and lived this truth, she was able to encourage Barak and the rest of the soldiers in the middle of all she had going on. Sometimes our answer or our breakthrough comes on the heels of encouraging someone else and pouring into them, even while we're in the middle of a hot mess ourselves. And if we had this strong of a belief that God's hand was in every effort of our day, I think we would be a lot more content with each day's accomplishments. We wouldn't be so overwhelmed with the busy schedule of our lives, but we'd believe that we can handle it because we know God is on our side. In Judges 5 verse 7, Deborah said, there were no warriors in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose to be a mother to Israel. What a neat picture. She describes herself as a mother to Israel. We can learn from this. Deborah cared about the people she led like a mother cared for her children. She was motivated to serve no matter what the demands were because she cared about the people. Moms, parents, like there are times when you feel completely empty, aren't there? Yet somehow, some way, you tap into something and you're able to push through, power through for your children, right? This is the picture we have here. 
And whenever I get overwhelmed, whenever I feel worn out or feel like quitting, throwing in the towel, I think about others. I think about my family. I think about my friends. I think about my church. Because if I stay thinking about myself, then I will quit. I will give up. I'll throw in the towel. But that's why I got to change my thinking. I got to change my perspective. And when I begin to think about the others that I care for and that God has entrusted me to help care for, it helps keep me going. Deborah is a great example of this. She became a mother to the Israelite people. And that relationship helped her to keep going and keep trusting. So church, I want to encourage you to give God every area of your life, the mundane things, the to-do lists, the frustrations. Give him especially those things that seem to constantly overwhelm you. And make God more a part of your day, your regular routine. And encourage someone else in the middle of your chaotic situation because that very well could unlock something for you, amen? In 1 Samuel chapter 22, we see David and he shows us how to trust God when life is not how you pictured it. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses one and two. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or in debt or who were discontented, until David was the captain of about 400 men. This is not how I pictured it. Have you ever said that? Have you thought that? We all have a picture of how we want our life to look, how we thought our life would play out. Everyone experiences periods in life that look nothing like they had imagined. Ashley and I didn't expect to have a third kid at just shy of 40, all right? But God, well, and some other stuff, but we won't get into that. But this is not how I pictured it. Listen, David, David was anointed the next king of Israel, He became a hero after conquering Goliath. He led numerous wins in battle, and he married the king's daughter. He had a good thing going. He had it all going for him. And then suddenly, because of a jealous king, David spent the next 10 or more years hiding in a cave, running from Saul with a gang of misfits. It would be safe to say that this was not how David pictured his journey toward becoming the next king of Israel. In difficult times, we may be tempted to believe that God has abandoned us or forgotten about us, that he's lost his vision for us. That temptation can be real and it can be strong to believe that our dreams were shattered and our hopes destroyed and God no longer has a plan for our lives. In those moments, when you have those emotions, you have to decide whether your faith is going to be in your circumstance or in God. It can't be in both. Putting our faith and trust in God means we're not going to quit, but rather continue to learn and grow and change. The story of David here in 1 Samuel illustrates God's destiny for our lives does not change because of our circumstances. No curveball, no attack of the enemy can derail God's plan for your life. Be encouraged by that this morning. David's destiny was fulfilled. The journey didn't look how he thought it would look, but the end game was the same. He became king of Israel. And in fact, his difficult circumstances along the way made him an even more compassionate and humble king than he would have ever been had he not walked through those challenges. There's no greater joy than seeing God's destiny rise above our circumstances. And what you are experiencing right now, and I declare by faith will endure, very well may be preparing you for the future plans God has for you. He wastes nothing, church. God will use it all for your good and for his glory. And we can all find inspiration in this story, right? David's journey to fulfill his destiny. Even though the road was not always smooth, so many moments, not how he pictured it, but we can learn our destiny is not determined by difficult moments. Our destiny is determined by God. 
Though our circumstances change, our destiny does not change. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 shows this. Because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Sometimes during these difficult times, these impossible feeling situations, we simply just need to remember God. (laughs) We get so consumed with ourselves and what's going on in us and around us, right? Stop and remember God. David embraced difficult times. He endured them because he believed that his future was in the hands of a God that loved him. Church, Your future is in the hands of a God who loves you. He's going to see you through. Don't let the current picture of your life change what you know to be true about the love and faithfulness of God and the plans that he has for you. Like we've heard the last several weeks, God is still writing your story. He's still painting your canvas. The paint's still drying. Don't you go try and adjust it. It's just going to make a mess. The paint's still wet, okay? Be patient. Don't try and figure it out all on your own. Submit to God. Acknowledge him. Talk to him. And like David, keep trusting him when your life is not how you pictured it. In Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God no matter the outcome. Man, these three dudes trusted God no matter what the outcome of their situation would be. I think a lot of times we trust God going into something, right? But that trust is kind of hinged upon how it all plays out. And when it doesn't play out how we thought it should, how we prayed it would, then our trust is shaken, maybe even broken. But these guys trusted God no matter the outcome. They were praying for a specific outcome. They were hoping for a specific outcome. They were even expecting a specific outcome. But even if if it didn't happen, that would not shake their trust. We know this story too. King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon was influenced by those around him to make an image of gold. And then he required everyone in the land to bow down and worship it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego You could say they respectfully declined. When the whole kingdom was following along, they stood their ground with faith that God would take care of them no matter the result. And even in this position that they were in, they did not feel the need to defend themselves for why they were not complying with the king's edict. They remained calm, confident, collected in the face of the king's anger and threats toward them. They had faith that God would save them because they trusted that God would take care of them, just like he always had. But the part that astonishes me the most in this story is is not just that God saved them from the flames, but it's that they kept their focus on him even if he didn't save them from the flames. Their faith allowed for contentment with whatever the outcome. They trusted God completely. And, and they were not motivated by their own success or, or their own glory or for their own story when they refused to bow down. They were motivated by the fact that God would be glorified through the result of either their sacrifice or their triumph. Either way, God would get the glory, whether it went good or bad for them. Wow. Church, I want to I wanna challenge you to think and pray about why you want a particular outcome in the situation that you are currently walking through. What is your motivation? Is it for God's glory or is it for your own? Don't let your faith be determined by the outcome. Let your faith be determined by who you are placing it in. Almighty God and no one else, amen? And nothing else, amen? And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, keep on trusting God no matter what the outcome is. He knows better, doesn't he? In Mark chapter five, I heard my mom say yes to that. He knows better, doesn't he? I still didn't get a whole whole bunch. 
I see some nods. I see, okay, I'm going to give you a pass. In Mark chapter 5, there's an unnamed woman that trusted God while she experienced physical pain. And that pain pushed her to take a risk. And God responded. It's Mark chapter 5. We find a pretty typical scenario. A large crowd had gathered around Jesus. People from all over the region rushed to hear him and even pressed up against him. And in this crowd was a woman who had been dealing with a chronic bleeding issue for 12 years. She had visited many doctors. She had spent everything that she had on treatments. But instead of getting better, her condition got worse. Raise your hand if you've ever seen things go from bad to worse. Because of the nature of this woman's illness, she was considered unclean according to the law. She was sick, she was broke, she was an outcast. Yet because of her confident faith in Jesus, she was able to ignore the pain for a moment and take a risk that changed everything. It was scandalous for this woman to be where she was. How dare she? (laughs) But she didn't let that pain, she didn't let her reputation stop her from seeking Jesus. And although we don't know this woman's name, her story is is unforgettable. Her faith is inspirational. She took a bold risk to believe in Jesus and in his mighty power. She stepped out of the shadows and made her way through this crowd so that she could get closer to Jesus and so that she could touch him. Man, when it feels like things will never change in my life, I'm realizing there's more to explore in my relationship with God. I get, sometimes I get stuck wanting my own way that I miss what God is doing and I miss the doors that he has opened. But when I see God move through my struggles, it helps my faith grow. I pray that for you too. I wonder if like this woman, does the condition of your health affect your faith? Whether it be physical or mental or emotional, If so, by faith, what can you do that might seem a little risky? What might seem a little out there? Like this unnamed woman, keep trusting God in the midst of the pain. Look to him and declare him as your healer. And prayerfully consider taking a risk of faith like she did. And our last story for the morning, it's Luke chapter 1. Zechariah and Elizabeth demonstrate trusting in God when a longing or desire is unfulfilled. Hmm. A longing unfulfilled can be disheartening. A longing unfulfilled can be devastating, depending on how long it has gone unfulfilled. Imagine having been married for a very long time, unable to have kids, and living in a culture that measured God's love for you by the number of children you have. People saw Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they wondered, what's wrong with them? What sin are they dealing with? Why is God mad at them? Man, this is the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, a couple described in Scripture as, quote, very old and childless. They're an example of people who understand longing unfulfilled. They know the heartache of being denied something that you long for and not knowing why it's being denied. Raise your hand if you've been denied something you've longed for for a long time. I'm sorry. Maybe it's a lingering health situation. Maybe it's a a child that is rejecting you. Maybe it's a character weakness Maybe it's a a sin issue that keeps tripping you up or a number of other things. Zachariah and Elizabeth understand. They understand how to remain faithful while waiting on God too. And that's what inspires me about them is that they continued to serve. God describes them in the middle of the longing unfulfilled that they're walking through. God describes them as righteous. Zachariah was actually serving God as a priest at the time. I mean, he was living for God and still had this longing unfulfilled. 
He could have easily given up on God. But he decided to keep serving despite this unfulfilled longing. I wonder, how do you handle adversity? If you're anything like me, then when you endure adversity for any length of time, you're tempted to, to lose faith, to get negative, to, to have a pity party, right? To start questioning things. Maybe you start praying less. Maybe you feel your faith shrink. But this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth shows the faithfulness of God, and it shows what it means to live by faith. God showed his faithfulness to them by working to bless their lives even after they had waited a long time. And when Elizabeth was 88 years old, she gave birth to John the Baptist. When we experience periods of waiting, we can have hope by remembering God's faithfulness and choosing to live by faith ourselves. What are you longing for? What desire has gone unfulfilled? Have you quit believing that God knows about it, that he cares about it, that he hears your prayers for it? Have you stopped praying for it because it's been that long? Like Zachariah and Elizabeth, keep trusting God even when the longings of your heart are unfulfilled. And before you're tempted to think or say, well, good for Moses and David and Deborah and the others, but my situation's different, Daniel. You don't understand where I'm at. I might not, but I know this. In Acts chapter 10 and in Romans chapter 2, we see that God does not show favoritism. We see that God is no respecter of persons, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, that he is faithful, not just to some people, but to all of his people. And God's salvation and all of the blessings that accompany it are available to all who trust in him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, one last time, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Church, you've got to trust God even when you can't track him. When you don't see him and don't sense him, you've got to keep trusting. You've got to trust him as you go through the testing. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. The teacher is always silent during the test. But God has not forgotten you. He has not forsaken you. He has not left you. He is there and he's asking you, child, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Church, I know this is so foundational. It's so elementary. But are we actually doing it? Have we just read this verse? Maybe even memorized it? Are we doing it? Do we really trust him? It doesn't matter in what you know. What are you doing with what you know? I know people that know more scripture than I do, but they don't believe it. They're not applying it. They're not living for God. So what's the point? James 1.22 says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James 4.17 goes further and says, anyone that knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Church, we've got to trust him. Not just read about it, not just be able to quote it, not just buy a pretty framed picture of it. We've got to actually do it. If you don't have the direction that you've been asking God for, then perhaps the reason is that you've not fully acknowledged him in all of the ways that we've mentioned. You've not really submitted to him. You're not really trusting in him. You're trusting more in yourself. Perhaps you show some situational trust for him. We are to trust him with all of our heart at all times and all of our ways. We've got to trust God even when we don't get the promotion. We've got to trust God even when our kids aren't living for the Lord. We've got to trust God when our 14 month old is still not sleeping through the night and we've tried everything, haven't slept good in over a year. 
We've got to trust God in spite of the negative doctor's report. We've got to trust God in the middle of these evil days that we're living in. We've got to trust him. We've got to trust him when we don't understand. Oh, but I want to understand. Yeah, I do too. But we've got to let that go. We've got to let that go. We can't lean on our own understanding. We've got to say, God, I give this to you. I submit to you. I trust in you alone. And by faith, I know that you will work this situation out just like you've worked out every other situation that concerns me and my family. Church, let's not trust in a chariot. Let's not trust in a horse. Let's not trust in ourselves or the power of positive thinking. Let's trust in the Lord. Let's put our full confidence in him and him alone at all times. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. You won't figure it out on your own but God can God can and God will if we trust him acknowledge him and submit to him in all of our ways amen amen come on stand to your feet let's lift our voices and declare our trust in the Lord this morning